There exist numerous myths surrounding the experiences of knights during the medieval times, propagated not only by Hollywood but also the contemporary legends of that era. These tales often depict chivalric knights swiftly coming to the aid of distressed damsels, embodying all that is noble and virtuous. However, the reality of being a medieval knight and their day-to-day -day activities was quite different. In this video, I'll cover the origins of knighthood, their training, tournaments and what their lives may have really been like. 95% of those that watch my videos aren't subscribed, so if that's you, subscribe, please. It's important to note that the term medieval times encompasses a vast period ranging from the 5th to the 15th century. Consequently, it's impossible to provide a specific account of the life of a knight during this extensive time span, as experiences varied across different regions. Nevertheless, I'll make an attempt to shed light on this topic while considering these variations. So, let's begin with the origins of knighthood. Although mounted warriors existed before, the concept of a knight, as we commonly understand it, emerged as an official rank during the 8th century among the soldiers of Charlemagne's army. Surprisingly, knights were essentially highly skilled soldiers on horseback. In fact, until they became obsolete on the battlefield towards the end of this era, knights primarily remained as elite warriors. While the training methods were initially less formalised, they became more structured over the centuries. Typically, young individuals of privileged birth, primarily males, were sent to a lord or knight for training when they were around the age of seven. At this stage, they would begin their journey as pages. During this period, they would practice with simulated weapons, learn horse riding, participate in hunts and perform various menial tasks to serve the knight and their household. Education might also be a part of their upbringing, although this was not always the case, especially in the early stages. Regardless, as knighthood developed, they would be taught about legendary knights of the past and the principles of chivalry. Upon reaching their early teens and demonstrating progress in their training, the young individuals would advance to the role of squires. As squires, their training would intensify, including the use of real weapons and taking a more active role in supporting the knight they served, potentially even participating in battles themselves. After undergoing approximately five to seven years of rigorous training, provided they survived and attained mastery in the required skills, individuals re would receive official knighthood. Initially, this process lacked grandeur and formality. However, during the late medieval period, the knighting ceremony took on a more recognisable form. This transformation was partially influenced by the church, which aimed to instill a greater sense of seriousness in knights and their adherence to chivalric oaths. Returning to the evolved knighting ceremony, the 14th century French knight, Geoffrey de Charny, describes the process as follows. The day prior to the knighting, the squire would first confess his sins and then bathe. Following this, he would be dressed primarily in white and red attire and participate in a prayer vigil. The next day, he would attend mass and receive communion, leading up to the actual ceremony. During this event, the squire would be presented with spurs and a sword, pledge loyalty to his lord, and at that particular time in history, take an oath to uphold various aspects of chivalry. Finally, he would be dubbed with a light blow and a kiss. Contrary to popular belief, especially in the early days of knighthood, the position was open to most soldiers who proved themselves as courageous warriors on the battlefield. However, as the position became more prestigious and exclusive, some individuals could secure knighthood through monetary means. Regardless, in order to become a knight, one had to possess some level of pre-existing nobility, even if they were just the son of another knight. It is important to note that not all knights were wealthy landowners with their own castles, despite common misconceptions. In fact, some knights didn't own any land at all. The rank of knighthood essentially granted them a minor noble status, 
Although many knights also held higher positions within the nobility based on factors separate from their military prowess. It should come as no surprise that the day-to-day -day activities of specific knights varied significantly depending on the individual in question. However, most knights were bound to a lord, pledging to serve them for a specified period each year, either in battle or by maintaining order on their lands when required. At the lowest level, some knights even resided in their lord's residence, serving as bodyguards, security personnel, occasional law enforcers and even acting as mediators in local disputes among the peasants. Essentially their daily lives were a blend of soldiering and police work. For others who owned estates their routines might involve similar duties but they also took on broader responsibilities such as managing their estates and overseeing the peasants under their control, including both freemen pledged to them and serfs. However, considering that knights could be called away for extended periods, they often had someone to assist them in managing affairs in their absence. Consequently, many knights found themselves with a considerable amount of free time on their hands. The question then arises, how did they occupy themselves day to day? It appears that many knights indulged in rather unruly behaviour. As previously mentioned, knights in medieval times were notorious for their tendency to cause disorder wherever they went. In fact, besides objectives like reclaiming Jerusalem from the Muslims during the First Crusade, one of the motivations, as stated by history professor Norman Cohn, was to give the largely unemployed and overly aggressive nobility of France something to do, remove them from Europe and prevent them from devastating the lands. However, it is important to acknowledge that while medieval lords were not known for treating their dependent peasants well, they were aware that slaughtering, raping and pillaging them would be counterproductive to maximising the productivity of their lands and labour. Engaging in such extreme behaviour could lead to outright revolts, which did occur occasionally. That being said, it doesn't mean that abuses didn't happen within their own lands, as evidenced by these sporadic uprisings, but taking things to an extreme was never seen as a wise approach. According to Constance Britton Bouchard, a professor of medieval history at the University of Akron and the author of Strong of Body, Brave and Noble, Chivalry and Society in Medieval France, most landlords were sensible enough not to harm their peasant tenants actively. After all, their own livelihood depended on the energy and success of the peasants. However, trespassing on another lord's lands, damaging their crops and mistreating their peasants could be advantageous, particularly if it was in a distant area where immediate retaliation against one's own lands and peasants was unlikely. In such cases, pillaging another lord's lands for personal gain could prove beneficial with little direct risk. As a mob of angry peasants armed with pitchforks did not necessarily pose a significant threat. This approach also provided a safer means to harm one's enemy compared to engaging directly in battle with their own knights. For example, in the writings of 12th century chronicler Orderic Vitalis, there is a praise for a knight who chose not to slaughter a large group of peasants during a raid expedition. Historian Catherine Hanley, in her book War and Combat 1150-1270, describes this account, stating that the knight's men destroyed the homes of the peasants and killed their livestock, but the knights spared their lives when they sought refuge around a cross. Vitalis considers this act of mercy worthy of eternal remembrance. In contrast, Walleran Count of Melant, a knight and lord of the 12th century, was known for simply cutting off one foot of any peasant he encountered while in his enemy's lands. Presumably, his intention was to incapacitate a useful worker and burden his enemy with a crippled and discontented individual, assuming they survived the encounter with this particular lord. As for what knights engaged in when they weren't involved in acts of rape and pillage, social gatherings and parties were common among the nobility. During their leisure time, knights participated in rather ordinary activities such as attending mass, playing games like backgammon and chess, and so on. 
Reading was a potential pastime for those who were literate, although books were scarce and expensive during much of this period. It is worth noting that while many wealthy knights were well educated, there were also numerous knights who lacked education and were unable to read or write. Lastly, training occupied the idle hours of bored knights. This involved activities like frequent hunting and participating in various tournaments. Regarding tournaments, initially the games were essentially massive melees with real weapons and the rules were minimal. They resembled actual battles. This included capturing other knights and grouping them by nation, intensifying the competition. However, the main objective, unlike in real battles, was not to kill opponents but to unhorse them and take them as prisoner. In the early stages, many knights even hired individuals specifically to assault the unhorsed knights, beat them severely and facilitate the extraction of their armour for ransom. The captured knights, stripped of valuables and horse, would later be offered back to the opposing side for a price, potentially including their armour and horse. Similar to real battles, nearby peasants were not necessarily safe during these tournaments. For instance, if a knight sought refuge in a peasant's home, it would likely be ransacked or even burned to coerce the knight into coming out. Additionally, farm fields in the vicinity were prone to trampling, resulting in lost crops. While knights, especially those of lower rank and lesser means, enjoyed tournaments for the chance to gain prestige, practice skills and acquire wealth through prizes and ransoms, the peasants and the church disapproved of the death and destruction surrounding these events. To mitigate the risks and casualties associated with tournaments, various rules were introduced over the centuries and blunted weapons became more common. By the late medieval period, tournaments began to resemble the depictions often seen in films today, albeit with less grandeur. Jousting gained popularity and designated areas with barriers were set up to minimise head-on collisions between knights. Blunted lances and specialised armour were also developed to reduce the risk of fatal injuries. Although death still occurred due to the high-speed clashes and the subsequent falls from horses, Overall, tournaments became more organised, safer and more enjoyable for the peasants as they evolved. As these events grew in popularity, measures were implemented to control knight behaviour, including the possibility of banning those who egregiously violated their chivalric oaths from competing. Nevertheless, in times of conflict, knights were always ready to serve their lords for a specified period, returning to their roles as elite warriors. During these periods, knights would typically have their own attendants and servants to cater to their needs, but the experience was far from pleasant. In the best case scenario, it could be a profitable endeavour, involving activities such as raiding, plundering neighbouring lands and bringing back spoils for themselves and their lords. However, it could also be terrifying and highly dangerous. The 14th century knight Geoffrey de Charny provides an account that illustrates the challenges. In this profession, one has to endure heat, hunger and hard work, sleep little and often keep watch. You'll be exhausted and sleep uncomfortably on the ground, only to be abruptly awakened. You'll often feel fear when you see enemies approaching with lowered lances ready to strike you down, and drawn swords poised to cut you. Bolts and arrows will come at you and you will struggle to protect yourself. You will witness people killing each other, fleeing, dying and being captured, and you will see the bodies of your fallen comrades. But as long as your horse remains alive and swift, you can escape in dishonour. However, if you stay, you will achieve eternal honour. From accounts like Geoffroy's and those of Knights of the Era, as well as other evidence, many contemporary scholars believe that post-traumatic stress disorder was not uncommon among knights, much like modern-day soldiers. In summary, the life of a medieval knight varied significantly, depending on the era and the knight's wealth. However, in general, most knights underwent extensive training to become elite warriors, occupying a position higher than peasants and enjoying greater freedoms and opportunities for advancement as a result. In their day-to-day -day lives, they were primarily engaged in activities such as maintaining the peace, when they themselves weren't disturbing it, managing their estates and workers, if they had any, 
hunting, participating in festivities, competing, training and occasionally participating in military campaigns for their faith or for their Lord. Again, really hope you enjoyed the video. Please, if you are one of the 95% that isn't subscribed, do subscribe. It is free. You can always change your mind. Uh, and yeah, stay tuned for the next video.